So I was trying to decide what the next reaction series should be. And then the winged hussars arrived. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. A little Sabaton reference there. We are going to dive into Extra History's series on the Siege of Vienna. This is one I've been wanting to do for a while. Uh, I'm excited to dive into this one. It's important to mention up front that when we're talking about this particular Siege of Vienna, that there are a lot to choose from. Uh, so let's take a look at that real quick. Uh, I just want to show you here. Uh, there were the Siege of Vienna in 1239. There's a Siege of Vienna of 1276, 1287, 1477, 1485, 1490, 1529, 1683, 1805, 1809. These were the captures of Vienna. Vienna Uprising in 1848, and then the Vienna Offensive of 1945. In this case, we are talking about what is typically referred to as the Battle of Vienna. Uh, typically, most of the time when people refer to the Siege of Vienna. They talk about the one from the 16th century. When they talk about the Battle of Vienna, even though it was also a siege, they're talking about the one from the 17th century, which is the one we're looking at today. As always, there's a link in the description that'll take you to the original content if you want to watch it without my commentary. It's a multi-part series. Let's go ahead and dive in. July 7th, 1683. Emperor Leopold heard mass that morning, continuing his normal schedule as if enemy troops were not loose in this country. The head of the Holy Roman Empire and defender of the faith may have been bookish, but he was also calm in a crisis. A courtier arrives, news from the field. The Turks have broken out, dust from their march rising in great columns. Tartar horsemen are ravaging the only troops blocking the advance. An Ottoman army is headed for Vienna. Leopold can't stay. His sons are both below the age of five, his wife pregnant, and his closest heir, the King of Spain, lies on his deathbed. He makes the sensible decision to run. So that evening, a convoy of fine carriages pulls out of Vienna. Over a hundred thousand Ottoman troops are heading for the city, but only 15,000 men defend its walls. They have only six days to prepare. How long can they hold? So if you're those 15,000 men in the city, all right, it, it's not really so much about how many men you have, because as long as you've got enough men to man the guns, to man the walls, Vienna, because of its location, has long been in a place where it's regularly uh, a part of sieges. It's regularly kind of finding itself on the front lines in various wars. In this case, it's kind of in the area that has become part of the front lines between Christian Europe and Muslim Ottomans, uh, the Muslim Ottoman Empire, and even Southeast Europe. Now, that's an oversimplification because you've got Muslims that are fighting on the Christian side. You've got Christians who fight on the Muslim side. So it's much more than just religion. There's a lot more politics at, at play here. But um, 15,000 men, don't let that make you think that it's a, a no-win situation. 15,000 men in a heavily fortified city, if well supplied, and if you've got enough to man the guns and man the walls, you can hold out against a 100,000-man army for a while. But this siege began as an idea in Istanbul over a year before. Mehmed IV was a student of history. Like Leopold, he loved nothing more than spending his days in the palace library, poring over accounts and records of the empire. It helped him understand his country's history and where he stood in it. He'd read how in 1453, his predecessor, Mehmed II, had conquered Constantinople. So Constantinople is now Istanbul. 1453 is one of those kind of uh, dividing lines in history. It, it's like 1066 for the British Empire. That's when the Norman invasion happens. Uh, it, there are certain moments in history by which we mark everything that came before it and everything that came after it. Uh, and 1453 is kind of the, the final end of what's left, the, the, the tiny remnants that are left of the old Roman Empire. Uh, and that's the moment at which Constantinople, Istanbul, Byzantium, whatever name it's been called over the years, falls forever into Turkish hands. The great city of Istanbul, where he now ruled. When his ancestors did that, they had become the inheritors of the Roman Empire by right of conquest. Among his other titles, Mehmed was Caesar of Rome. But a year before that conquest, an Austrian duke of the Habsburg line rallied enough support from the elector counts to get crowned as Holy Roman Emperor. 
And just to, for perspective on that, the Holy Roman Emperor was an elected title, and there were electors. There were certain positions, inheritable positions, in which you got to be one of those electors when the Holy Roman Emperor died and it was time to se select a new one. It's almost like a similar situation to the Pope, where you have cardinals who are eligible to vote. Not all cardinals are eligible to vote. I think they have to be under 80. Um, but they're kind of like the cardinals of the Holy Roman Empire, right? They they are the electors. Some, sometimes you see that reference to like the prince elector of Saxony. That means he's a prince, but he's also an elector for the Holy Roman Emperor. And the Holy Roman Emperor can be chosen from pretty much anywhere. You know, sometimes it was the King of Spain. Sometimes it was, uh, you know, other members of other families. But by this point, the Habsburgs have a pretty strong hold on a good bit of Europe. There couldn't be two heirs of Rome. And to the Ottomans, these German kings were pretenders. Mehmed knew that since then, the Ottomans and the Habsburgs had battled for supremacy, expanding towards each other as the Kingdom of Hungary. So you can see here on this map what I'm talking about, how Vienna, though it's in Central Europe, really is kind of on the front lines of this uh, area here. And Hungary is kind of the the buffer zone. It's Poland in 1939 between Germany and the Soviet Union. You know, it's the one that uh, kind of finds itself in the middle and depending on who's winning and who's doing well, kind of conflicting alliances and, and shifting loyalties and uh, one country will conquer, then the other will conquer. And uh, so because of that, Vienna is really the target if you're the Ottomans. Which separated them fell apart. Now that land was a mixed frontier of Ottoman and Habsburg forts as much Western Asia as it was Eastern Europe. Mehmed read how his predecessors had made great gains there, and he had too. Indeed, the empire was at its greatest extent ever. In 1529, his ancestor Suleiman had even besieged the Habsburg capital of Vienna, and he would have taken it too, if not for an early winter. And though he had been a good custodian of the state, Mehmed knew his accomplishments didn't measure up to those storied ancestors. To truly live in history, he would have to do more than take further bites out of Ukraine. But Mehmed's Grand Vizier, Kara Mustafa Pasha, had an audacious plan. He too had something to prove. His family had served as viziers to the Ottoman sultans for a quarter century, and had helped the empire reach its current height. But Kara Mustafa was also adopted, and perhaps felt a need to prove himself mm. worthy of his family legacy. So, he proposed that they outdo the sultan's namesake. The great Mehmed II had plucked the red apple of Constantinople. So this is kind of fascinating because it's reminding me of other times in history where you have a very ambitious ruler who finds himself looking at his predecessors and thinking, man, if I could just be like that. Perfect example comes to mind for me as someone who has studied a lot of British monarchy history. Henry VIII so wanted to be the next Henry V. He wanted to have his own Agincourt, that great victory where Henry V was heavily outnumbered against France and wins this just, just impossible victory on French soil and all but conquers France and, and, and wins it possibly for his son, but then everything falls apart. And um, Henry VIII wanted to be that guy, and, and that led him into disastrous campaigns at times in France, trying to achieve that level of glory for himself. And it's happened other times, too. Uh, another example I can think of is uh, Santa Anna. Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna, who was the great general and also president of Mexico. Uh, he called himself the Napoleon of the West. He looked uh, to France. He saw what Napoleon Bonaparte had done in his lifetime, and he wanted to do that. He wanted to replicate that in North America, and he never quite lived up to that. But they would finally pick the Golden Apple, the place that had evaded even the Sultan's illustrious ancestors, Vienna. It was a bold plan, one that would humiliate the Habsburgs, seize their trade routes, and create a bastion to secure their territory in the Balkans, Hungary, and Ukraine. And though it was true that the city was a long way off, at the farthest limits of the empire's striking distance, the prospect wasn't ludicrous. In fact, 1682 was the best time in a century to take Vienna. See, for the last two decades, the empires had been at peace, and Leopold had used that period of calm to refocus his military on guarding his western borders from French encroachment. 
the eastern sector was neglected. And Ottoman spies reported that more modern earthworks around Vienna crumbled from inattention. The city's stone wall was still medieval. Mm. Its blocks held together by gravity rather than mortar, meaning the city's defense was akin to sort of a giant Jenga tower. Uh. Ottoman artillery only had to knock some blocks out, and the whole thing would come tumbling down. So without mortar holding it all together, it is. It's just like Jenga. That's a perfect analogy for that. I hadn't thought of that is that they're just sat on top of each other and the weight of the ones above are holding down the ones below. So yeah, you could take the whole walls down with cannon and cannon have been around for centuries by this point. Heck, it sounds like Zoe could do that job if she was bored enough. Sorry, back to it. In addition, the deeply Catholic Habsburgs' brutal oppression of Protestants had unsettled their rule in Hungary. The Ottomans had long experience backing Protestant unrest and some on the frontier even considered the Muslim empire a more tolerant ruler than the Catholic Habsburgs. And there's my point about how it's not as simple as Christian versus Muslim, because uh, within Islam, uh, Islamic nations and Islamic people groups, and within Christian groups, there are further divides. And by this point, you've had the uh, Protestant uh, Reformation, uh, that has taken place, not really Reformation, Pro Protestant Revolution, really, because it started out as an attempt to reform the Catholic Church, but that, by this point, they've broken off large parts of uh, what we know today as Germany, which is the Holy Roman Empire, uh, are, uh, are Protestant at this point. England is Protestant at this point. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on. And so, yeah, at times, if you're Protestant and you find yourself oppressed by the Catholics, the, the Muslims become your ally. The enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. So if they marched on Vienna, Protestants would rally to their aid. So in January of 1682, Kara Mustafa formally declared war on the Holy Roman Empire. Austrian diplomats watched as two Janissaries planted horsehair standards outside the palace in Istanbul. It was an old tradition, one that recalled the Ottomans' origins as nomadic horse tribesmen migrating out of Central Asia. Because while Islamic, the Ottoman Turks had retained their distinct culture. Hmm. And for centuries, this gesture meant to prepare for war. But in Vienna, Leopold and his ministers dismissed these reports. The real threat, they reasoned, was France. The Ottomans were planning some kind of frontier incursion, probably to take a few forts, or at most, cutting north to hit the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It's easy to judge him and say, come on, man, why weren't you prepared for that? But if it hadn't happened for a hundred years or more, that's that's not only his lifetime, that's the lifetime of his parents and grandparents and even great grandparents. So uh, it's understandable that he would feel like that wasn't a real threat. Meanwhile, the Ottoman army gathered. The corps came first. Elite horseback archers. Levies from North Africa, Arabia, Egypt, and Anatolia. Huge artillery pieces. A baggage train of camels. Siege engineers, adept at tunneling below enemy walls and Which will bringing come in handy. them down with gunpowder charges. You know, we think of, uh, like, tunnels and mines as being a more recent thing. You know, people think of all the mines that were used during the First World War or even the crater uh, in the American Civil War in Petersburg. But, you know, their mines were used extensively in Vicksburg, for example. But this goes back hundreds if not thousands of years and mines are going to play a big part of this uh, timeline uh, and become a real threat to Vienna and the famous Janissaries elite assault troops drilled with swords and heavy bore muskets each carrying a bag of grenades spheres of glass or clay and they are stormtroopers this is really I don't know if it is the inspiration for the Germans in the First World War for the development of stormtroopers, but that's really what they are. They're the frontline troops that are supposed to break through and, and allow for your main infantry to come in. Casing handfuls or of cavalry. Powder. Once, long ago, Janissaries had been Christian children taken as a tithe, converted, and indoctrinated as soldiers. But now, they were a privileged class, and families jockeyed to place their sons in their ranks. Each unit was a sworn brotherhood. Every man marked with a tattoo, giving his serial number and unit designation. Hmm. As the army marched out of the capital, the Janissary's supreme commander, the man whose tattoo was a simple number one, ah. traveled with them. The Sultan himself. Now, in the European imagination... That's, that's kind of awesome. I mean, I know that tattoos on arms have a different connotation today because of the Holocaust, but it's kind of an awesome thing when you think about how that must have given them pride uh, and given them a sense of 
honor and belonging and that they were something special. That's pretty cool. I mean, soldiers were a savage horde. But in truth, this army was organized down to the smallest detail. Every squad had a sleeping tent and a cooking pot. They had mobile latrine tents, enough food to sustain them for the whole campaign, and even designated cobblers. In this is really pretty brilliant when you think about the innovations of this, because 80 years later, 90 years later, in the American Revolution, you'll find that when George Washington's putting his army together, they're not that well organized. They need someone like Baron von Steuben to come along and kind of instill in them those important things like putting the latrine outside of camp and, uh, and drill and organization. And, you know, an army can't march except on its supplies. Uh, so, you know, making sure they're well supplied, well organized, that, that you've got the latrine um, set up a certain way to help prevent disease. These are all really innovative things and important. In fact, Ottoman military planners had calculated how long a Janissary could march before his shoes would need new soles. Talk about crossing I's and dotting T's, hmm. both of which are not in the word shoes. Right, let's move on. As they moved into the frontier, Protestant levies joined them, their numbers swelling to 140,000. But when they reached Belgrade, the Sultan handed command to his Grand Vizier and turned back. Ceremonial deniability. Huh. If Kara Mustafa succeeded, the Sultan would take credit. But if he failed, the blame would be his alone. Yep. And it was only then, at the end of March 1683, that the Grand Vizier informed his officers of their target and sent a final declaration of war to Vienna. When the message arrived, Leopold realized he'd lost time dismissing the Ottoman threat. He dispatched diplomats to Jan III Sobieski, the King of Poland and the Grand Duke of Lithuania, proposing a mutual defense pact. Poland and Lithuania are joined under Jan Sobieski III, um, at this point, it's called the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, it's a loose comparison, but think Austro-Hungarian Empire, dual monarchy kind of thing. Similar concept. The 54-year-old king, elected to the throne on the strength of his military record, readily agreed. Should the Turks attack Krakow, Vienna would send aid. And, you know, vice versa. Not that they would ever dare. Still thinking Poland was the target, the emperor appointed his brother-in-law. Charles, Duke of Lorraine, as head of his army. Though an aristocrat, Charles was an experienced military officer, but also an eccentric one. He dressed in high fashion, but let his clothes wear out until they were stained and torn. His wig literally rotted off his head, but he was also infamously durable. In his career, he'd survived head wounds, smallpox, and a nosedive off a bridge. To command Vienna's garrison, Leopold picked Count Ernst von Stachenberg, a man with an unremarkable military record, but a steely disposition that might come Meh. in handy. Yet the most important defender was not a duke or count, but a fabulously expensive mercenary. George Rimpler was a German military engineer who'd written a treatise on fort design. He'd also faced the Ottomans before and knew their siege capabilities. For months, Rimpler worked day and night to modernize Vienna's crumbling outer earthworks, ditches, and revelins. Triangular platforms meant to funnel attackers into kill zones. Rimpler sunk pointed stakes into the mm. earthworks to create fences and fighting platforms. And though simple, when wrecked by cannonballs or mines, these wooden palisades turned into debris fields that slowed or halted attacking infantry. Stone, by contrast, collapsed into easily scalable piles. And then came July 7, the day, too late, far too late, that Leopold realized Vienna was the target. Panic gripped the district. The city's nobles fled along with the emperor. 60,000 of the city's wealthy took to the road, replaced by refugees from the countryside. Rimpler and Stop And what's the problem with all the refugees coming in from the countryside? It's more mouths to feed. It's more waste that gets produced. It's more people who need to consume water, which is probably going to get cut off. The worst thing that can happen in a siege is that you have to deal with tens of thousands of civilians inside the city walls. Stachenberg madly tried to finish the defenses, torching the city's outskirts to clear a field of fire. Charles took the army into a blocking position, but he'd underestimated the Ottoman speed. By the time he deployed, the dust plumes of enemy cavalry were already behind him. He fought his way clear and sent the infantry to bolster the city's defenses, spiriting his cavalry into the woods, hoping to keep Vienna's supply lines open. And on July 14th, the Ottomans arrived at Vienna. Two days later, cavalry stormed the smoking outskirts of the city, 
throwing back the defenders and securing a base of operations. A place for Kara Mustafa to draw up his artillery. On the walls, Vienna defenders saw smoke jet from the line of cannons. Pencil lines appeared in the sky. The arc of incoming cannon fire. Then behind them, the crack hmm. of lead on stone. Broken glass coughed outward. A church steeple crumbled. Then another. Any high tower, any house that poked above the earth fortifications became a target. Vienna was burning. And there was nothing to do but hold. All right, there's the start of that one. So let me know your thoughts. Add to the conversation. Let's learn from each other. There's a lot about this story I don't know. I've already learned some things, so I'm excited to learn more when we come back tomorrow. Thanks for watching.